love talking about revival and all the principles of revival. Personal revival begins with my relationship with the Lord. And I kind of had this idea for years that prayer was like brownie points with God. We use the term brownie points in New yeah. Zealand. You know, that, I don't think I've ever used that term here. But the prayer was like, you're getting my brownie points with God. And so you, you pray so that God was, you know, oh yeah, he prayed today. You know, a little tick in the box, you know. <laughs> and uh, I finally get to realize, no, there's a whole lot more to it than that. And for those who's just the tick in the box, uh, to spend an hour with Jesus and like it, that does sound like way out there. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to enjoy this. Um, so I wrestled with prayer. And what I'm going to share with you for the next little bit here is some things that initially I heard Dick Eastman uh, from back then it was Change the World Schools of Prayer. Today he's connected with World Literature Crusade. And it was material that he shared that when I began to put this into practice in my life, I found it to be incredibly significant on a personal basis. Uh, my wife observed to me in the months that followed that she found herself a little jealous uh, as she was watching the changes taking place inside of me as I was beginning to you know, just put this into practice in my life. So what I'm going to share with you is really the basis and has been the basis of, uh, of my prayer life now for 35, 40 years. And kind of what I do, at least in a portion of my prayer time, and I will say it from the outset, I don't want this to be viewed as, as real religious because I'm going to walk through what, you know, I would call 12 steps um, that you, you'd use in spending an hour with the Lord. I may not go through all 12 steps in any given day. I may go through you know, six, seven steps. Other days I may go through all 12 of them. I was in uh, Christ Church, oh, maybe a year ago, uh, in the last year anyway. And in the church I was speaking at, a young man came up to me and said, I was so excited when Pastor announced you were coming because I've been waiting to share this with you. He said, sometime back I heard you speak to a group of men on the subject of spending an hour with the Lord every day in prayer. He goes, and I, I attended that and I, I listened, I took notes, and I began to practice that which you taught and it revolutionized my life. He said, not only did it revolutionize my prayer life, he's been now the whole flowing and prophetic. He goes, and so many things have taken place in my life, I realized it was coming out of that foundation. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell this story now rather than later. Uh, because so much uh, of what's happened for us, I recognize I can, I can trace it back at one level to beginning to get a handle on how to spend time with the Lord on a regular basis basis, how to do that systematically and spend time with Him. And indeed at one point I was asking the Lord why I was experiencing something. Uh, revival had broken and, um, and what was taking place in the evening meetings was now becoming a part of daily life. You know, the manifest presence of God was just, uh, you know, just showing up and abiding. So I'd get up in the middle of the night and there'd be like a river you know, they would just be there. They go out to eat lunch, and the river would be there. I humorously say that it messed up my golf game because I'd be standing over a ball trying to putt the ball, and I'd be feeling this river. My legs are shaking, and I can't even hit the golf ball. And uh, But it was cool. And so I finally said to the Lord, why? Why is this happening? And his response, and I don't know if you found this to be true, that often if I ask the Lord a question, he responds, with a question. And often the answer, you know, to my question is found in the answer to his question. And so I said to him, why is this happening to me? And he said, what have you been asking me for every day for the last 20 years in your life? And he reminded me of something I was talking about in a few minutes about a particular time in prayer where I'm asking the Lord for his presence. And he said, all I'm doing is answering your prayer. He said, you had no idea, no concept when you were asking that, what it actually meant. He said, but that's what I'm doing. And so I recognize that so much of the stuff that Lynn and I get to be a part of is because of this. 
Now, somebody said, why an hour? And I don't want to be legalistic with this. Uh, a biblical basis is Matthew chapter 26 and verse 40. When Jesus came to the disciples and found them asleep, and he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? It's the only place in Scripture that I'm aware of where there's ever a connection between a period of time and prayer. Where when prayer and time are the same sins and the Lord links together the thought of you know, praying in one hour. Now, I don't think that means that if I pray less than an hour that I fail to have anything like that. But I think it's a good target for people to say, to come to that point in my life that at a minimum that I'm spending an hour with the Lord. The second observation is sometimes it takes a period of time to get into a spirit of prayer. And those who, their prayer life is basically the five minute you know, a variety. Thank the Lord for at least the five minutes. But rarely do they really cross over that point of really entering into the spirit of prayer. And I think it just takes time to really do that. And so for many people, they find that when they begin to commit to something like this, you know, that begins that, uh, begin to get into that spirit of prayer. The other thing, I'm reminded of a story that Dick Eastman told. And uh, he said he was teaching on prayer and somebody brought him a cassette tape. Remember those things, you know, cassette tapes? That tells how old you are. Uh, and, uh, and he said somebody brought him a cassette tape of this guy and, and Eastman said when he saw the title, it was, it was like almost as automatic turn off because it was this archbishop. And he said, that said, you know, Catholic. And Eastman said, you know, he said, born, you know, um, just, uh, what, what's the word he would have used? Uh, died in the wool, you know, uh, yeah. Pentecostal, evangelical, you know, Christian, you know, Catholic. You know, I mean, just like, but, you know, he decided to listen to the tape anyway. So he was sitting in his little prayer chapel in his backyard that he had built and was listening to this. And he said the speaker was speaking to a group of, of uh, priests and nuns. And he said to them, he said, it occurs to me as I'm standing up here and you're sitting out there, that most of you sitting out there are smarter than I am standing up here. He said, therefore, why am I speaking and you're listening? And uh, Dick said, I'm thinking, okay, why? And he said, because my words have power. And he said, and why do my words have power? And he said, my words have power. He said, because every day of my life, for the last, I don't know, like 40, 45 years at that point, he said, I have spent at least one hour a day in unbroken fellowship with the Lord in prayer. He said, well, there was one day. He goes in that. 40 some years, 20, you know, all that. Time. He said, it was one day that I didn't do that. He said, one day he was speaking in Paris, France, and they had arranged for a little chapel for him to pray in. And he said, he sat down right at two o'clock. He had on the schedule two o'clock to three o'clock to pray. He said, he sat down, bowed his head, and fell asleep. <laughs> and woke up right at three o'clock. And he said, he looked to heaven and said, Lord, does that count? <laughs> and the Lord said to him, my disciples spent their first hour sleeping as well. He said, I'll let it go this time. <laughs> and, uh, but, but he said the whole thing of, of this, the guy's words had power. And I recognize, uh, I won't go into the story now just for the sake of time, but I shared a bit the other day with some of the leaders of a time in my life when God told me that I was average, called me average. And... Um, and in one sense, that became a very liberating word because when God tells you that you're average, you can quit trying to perform. You know, if God says you're average, then you're average. You know, so you can quit trying to be something you're not. But again, to become aware. And somebody was talking about, but, I said, no, no, God said I was average. He didn't say that what happens has to always be average, but that I'm an average person. And when average people follow certain principles, in God's word, you can see God do extraordinary things with and through people who are average. Most of us are average. Uh, a past president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, once said, God must love the common person because he made so many of them. That's where most of us find ourselves, isn't it? So 
I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you what 12 steps, and if you gave every one of these things, I'm going to give you five minutes. 12 times five is 60 minutes. That's one hour. Some of them may not take five minutes. Some of them may take more than five minutes. Um, I'm flexible with that. Some days, some things may take me 15, 20 minutes, and other things only a couple of minutes. Other days, I may go five minutes for every single one of them. I don't want you to get rigid on it, but I want these to become something to help you to develop a well-rounded, balanced prayer life. With each one of the 12, I will give you a one word, and then I'll give you a three word definition and some passages of scripture. I'm gonna suggest you write the scriptures down because the real value of this will probably come later as you go back and look at those scriptures, meditate on them. Certainly this is what happened for me. When I listened to Dick Eastman teach it, there was value that came in that teaching, but as I was taking note of those scriptures, and whether you do that with pen and pencil or do that on your smartphone or whatever you do it on, and uh, you know that there's, there's value in that. So let's get started. Number one. And before we do that, Father, I just want to thank you. And there's a way, Father, that I normally pray and invite people to pray with me. But this time I'm gonna do it different. I just wanna thank you, Father, that I can take a few minutes here to share with these friends on this vital subject of how to spend time with you. And Father, I'm asking that you would sharpen me as I share that those sort of things, Father, that need to be shared, that you'll bring those to the front of my thinking. Things, Lord, that are not necessary, but I'll be able to just lay them aside so that the material will be that which will be a great value to those that are listening and or watching. In Jesus' name. So if you want to write down a one word, the first word I would use is the word praise. Praise. Because I believe that the doorway in which we come into the presence of the Lord is found in praise. Three word definition, give God glory. When I am praising, I am giving God glory. So that's the three word definition that I would use. And I'm going to give you four verses, four passages of Scripture to jot down. Psalm chapter 63 and uh, verse 3 and 4 is a good one to write down. Psalm 63, 3 and 4 is a good one to write down. And then the one that has revolutionized my life on a personal basis is Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power and praise, for Thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they were and are created that particular verse really changed my life in relationship to worship and since praise is that worship part of prayer when I begin to realize that I worship the Lord not because of what I feel but because of who he is because you see I can come to church I can come to a meeting like this and come from a situation that just happened that wasn't good, and my mind is on that situation, and, and particularly a uh, difference between men and women, uh, because you know men tend to compartmentalize their lives. We got this compartment and this compartment and this compartment and this compartment, and what's happening in this com compartment has nothing to do with this compartment over here. And so sometimes a man can come out of a situation where maybe he just had a debate, you know, with uh, with a spouse. And, and maybe some heated words, step into church, lift his hands, begin to sing praises to God. His wife's thinking, you hypocrite, you, you know. But, you know, him is compartmentalization. But for ladies, you know, it's much more like spaghetti. You know, everything's tangled together and woven together, and everything connects to everything else. And so often for a lady, if she just had this, you know, family argument en route to church, you know, to walk into church and begin just to you know, worship God in other language and praying in the spirit and singing, it's just like it just doesn't feel right. And But when I begin to understand that worship is not based upon what I'm feeling, worship is based upon who He is, His worthiness. And I discover He's worthy on my good days. And He's worthy 
on my bad days. But if I'm having a day like, oh man, it's so much fun, I can't wait to go talk to Jesus today. If I'm having one of those days that, do I have to? He's still worthy. And then here's, here's two more verses. Psalm 48, 1 and Matthew 6, 9. Matthew is the Lord's Prayer where he begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's expression of praise and worship. Uh, let me move on before I get myself too sidetracked on any one of these. The second, yes. I'm sorry, Matthew. 6, 9. I'm sorry, Matthew 6, 9. By the way, another great one is Psalm 100. In fact, almost any one of the Psalms. The Psalms is a great place to worship from. You just go to the book of Psalms and just begin to worship out of almost any single chapter there. In Psalm 100, talks about coming before His presence with singing, entering His uh, gates with thanksgiving, and coming into His courts with praise. And so uh, to work, to, to praise, which is give God glory. Second five minutes, okay? My clock, key word, wait. W-A-I-T. Three word definition, total quiet time. Total quiet time. Uh, let me give you four verses of scripture. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.2, 5.2. In the Living Translation, I think it says something like this. God's in heaven, you're on earth, let your words be few. <laughs> you know, there are moments we come into the presence of the Lord for just some time, but just sitting there, being there. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Now, these are verses we Pentecostals don't do so good with. In, uh, mainline churches, they kind of do better on the be still time. And we're kind of like, you know, let's come in and who stole my Honda or something, you know, and just go at it. And then Psalm 27 and 14. Psalm 27, 14. Total quiet time. The time that I'm not giving God instruction. Here's how I often begin that time. I'll say, Lord, for the next five minutes or whatever, I just want to just be with you out of any particular agenda out of anything I particularly want to say it's just like Lord I want to come before your throne and just kneel here and I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and to guide me into the rest of my time of prayer so I may have these steps that I would typically follow but I'm also at this moment being very open to the Holy Spirit saying here's the direction I want you to go today Here's where the focus will be. So I may say, Holy Spirit, if you do not give me a focus, then I will do this. If you give me a focus, then I'm going to follow that particular focus. So that gives me a, a launching pad, you know, if you please, for what I'm going to do. So it's just a total quiet time. And interesting for me, uh, two or three things that came out of the quiet time in, in my life, that five minutes, uh, I sensed that I was growing quieter on the inside, that some of that racing was beginning to settle down. And I cannot prove this, but I had had a physical taken in preparation to drive a school bus for a school system. And I was within the safe zones, but my blood pressure was on the upper side of the safe zone. When I began to practice this, the, the 12 steps of prayer, particularly just that waiting time, and I felt like I was going quieter on the inside. It was interesting to note that when I began taking my blood pressure after that, it had come down significantly. Can I prove there's a connection? No. I can't prove there's a connection, but I've always suspected there was a connection between learning to just wait upon Him. It's also interesting for me that a lot of the times when the Lord speaks to me, it's been right then. You know, just when I'm waiting on Him. I'm not even asked him anything specific. I'm just there. Saying, well, you know, this is just, you know, I'm just going to give you this time, Lord, just for the next few minutes. So that's the wait time. The next five minutes in my prayer time is this. Confession. Confession. Uh, three words. Temple cleansing time. Well, here's another three words. Admit my mistakes. Or maybe admit my sins. 
you know. You know, if you want to be really forthright, admit my sins, but or at least admit my mistakes or temple cleansing time. And two passages of scripture, I will pray one of these two passages of scripture every day in my life. The first one is Psalm 51, verse 10 and 11. And I pray these two verses more than any other single passage of scripture out of the King James Version, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I will break that up into four components or four elements. And the first thing is, Lord, I want you to search out my heart, examine my heart, the real me, on the inside and I want you to show me if there's anything in the last 24 hours that I have done that's been displeasing to you and then I will sit there for a few moments and just review with the Holy Spirit the last 24 hours of my life since I last spent time with the Lord in prayer since I last spent a temple cleansing time and just see if the Holy Spirit flags something that I need to repent of and then I move to the next part, which is renew a right spirit within me. That deals a lot with my attitudes. You know, I think many of us understand attitudes tend to make us or break us in life. There are a lot of people that have lost jobs, not because they're not competent, but because their attitude stinks. And so the boss knows I can't let them go for their attitude. So I'll find something else. I'll find another reason that I'm going to let them go. But the bottom line was their attitude was the sort of attitude that just was so destructive and negative to everybody around them. Attitude makes us. So I often pray in that prayer, Lord, I want you to give me a right attitude, a right spirit towards your word today. God, give me a right spirit, attitude towards your work today. Give me a right attitude towards your workers. Give me a right attitude today towards your world. So I'll just pray my way through. God, give me a right spirit today. I may pray something like, Lord, I want you to give me the excellent spirit that you gave Daniel, the meek spirit that Moses operated in. And just begin to pray that way. The third thing I pray is cast me not away from your presence. That was the one the Lord said, what have you been asking me for every day? And for years, I really, you know, I prayed that, but I didn't really pray that with the same level of intensity. It has become a focus for me. Lord, I really want to walk in your presence today, the tangible presence of God today. And then number four, take not your Holy Spirit. Lord, I need in my life the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because, Lord, I'm going to stand today before individuals in an elective. And I'm going to stand before a tent the city full of people in a meeting and I'm going to be sharing your word with them and I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to help me to be able to communicate in a way that's effective in a way where the word being shared you know, goes deep into the heart and ministers to that individual so I pray off the Lord for the anointing now the other passage of scripture I will pray if I don't use Psalm 51 is Psalm 139 verse 23 and verse 24 search me O God and know me try me know my thoughts see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting and so I invite the Holy Spirit to search me to cleanse me and to just invent and when I pray that I'll pray the tripart being Lord I want you to examine my spirit you know the real me deep on the inside search out my spirit and the Lord, I want you to look into my soul, my mind, you know, my emotions, uh, my will. Search out that part of my life today. And then I would say, and then Lord, my actions. You know, the actions in the last 24 hours. Now, interesting for me, when my wife and I first visited to the great revival that took place in Pensacola, Florida in the mid-90s, many of our friends went. And many of our friends were sharing these stories with us of this incredible God encounter where they were like brought face to face with stuff in their life and you know it's uh, 
is they're, they're laying on the face, weeping at the altar, just broken before God. And, and, and I'm hearing so many of these stories, I'm starting to feel guilty because that had not been my experience. We'd walked into Brownsville, and man, the intensity, the conviction was evident, and I loved it. And yes, there was a sense of God talking to me, but there wasn't this huge, you know, overwhelming sense of my guilt before the Lord. And all my friends are talking this way. I'm beginning to say, God, am I so calloused? You know, that I'm not even... And the Lord spoke to me and said, what have you been doing every day in your life for the past number of years? And he took me to this part right here. He said, every day you have come before me and you have allowed me to speak to you about the issues. He says, so therefore, he said, you've not got this long list that some of your friends had because they weren't giving me that opportunity. He said, therefore, he said, when you got here, I said, I only needed to do some refining, you know, some retuning of some stuff. He said, because every day you've given me the opportunity to talk to you. Temple cleansing is not negative. It's a positive time where I'm allowing the Lord to just cause the thing between he and I to be so right that our relationship is such a wonderful and beautiful relationship. In the same way that when the air is clear between two friends who have an issue between them and they deal with the, that issue, you know, that's not a negative, that causes their friendship to grow. A husband and wife who've had a point where there's been this issue between them, but when they deal with the issue and, and necessary apologies are made and the issue is put to rest, and the relationship is stronger for having dealt with it. If they never dealt with it, their relationship would never reach the point that God wanted it to reach. It's true of my relationship with the Lord as well. Number four, the fourth thing, my fourth step, key word, word. The word, W-O-R-D, three word definition, read the word, otherwise known as read the Bible. And verse of Scripture, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10, which is kind of a neat little passage in Psalm 19 because it's a description of the Word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea than much fine goat, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Uh, I left out a couple of verses. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Uh, you know, it's just some powerful expressions describing the worth and the value of God's word. And so in my, now the purists will say, well, you weren't praying, you were reading God's word. It's the hour I'm spending with the Lord, okay? And so it's the time I'm letting God talk to me through this book and to read God's Word. Uh, number five, number five, intercession, intercession. Three-word definition, remember the world. Remember the world. That before I begin to bring to the Lord my needs, which I will in a moment, I want to say, Lord, what is it that you would like me to talk to you about as it relates to the kingdom of God, as it relates to the needs uh, in my city or the needs in the world? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Listen to how the apostle writes it. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Father, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, intercession can take on so many forms that we could spend, you know, I could spend and my wife could spend hours just teaching on intercession. Uh, but I think it's a good thing that before I bring my needs to the Lord, I say, Lord, what is it that's on your heart? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to bring before the Father today? Here's where you are agreeing together with the Lord.
for the things that relate to the kingdom of God. Stuff that may not affect you personally. And now, I'm not going to say this, what God's going to ask everybody to do. But the Lord challenged me to become a world prayer missionary. And so I have, uh, I think I have it in this one as well. I have it in my, uh, yeah, I do. I have right here a world prayer map that has all the nations of the world on it broken down into a into a 31-day cycle. And I can just every day pray my way through a group of nations. Now, doing that, I started doing that many years ago. And as I was doing that, I was challenged to begin to find a nation that become a focus for me. And so over the years that followed, on Mondays became a China focus. So I began to pray for the nation of China. And then I discovered that there was whole groups of people that God had given them a burden to pray for China. And I would pray for the bamboo curtain, you know, to be destroyed. That the fire of God would burn up the bamboo curtain. And then I began to discover that there were people who were praying and people who were getting in behind the bamboo curtain. And we discovered that God was answering prayer. There was an incredibly vibrant church in China that somewhere in the neighborhood of minimally 30,000 people a day, and this is a 20-year-old statistic now, so it's newer than that, more than that, but at least that many a day were coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in China. And so... Monday became a day that I prayed for China. Over a period of time, God especially drew my attention to the nation of Myanmar, to the nation of Burma. And I began to pray. And, and, and what I did was I simply went to the library. You can do it today on Google. But back then I went to the library and put out the encyclopedias and did a little bit of research on the nation of Myanmar. And I broke it up. And I have, do I have it with me? There's another briefcase. I do have it. I have it with me. A little prayer thing that came with me and it's broken down by days and there is an, on every one of these days a little index card that was material I put together on Myanmar 25 years ago that carries with me and I will use that as a starting point often when I'm praying for that nation now interesting I talk about there's some things that God's done in our lives that relate back to this and uh, when when I had no interest in traveling outside the United States when God called me to preach. My only prayer was, God, don't send me to Chicago and don't send me to New York. Otherwise, I'll say yes to preach. Because as a boy growing up in rural, you know, downstate Illinois, Chicago scared me to death. And New York City, even more so. I never thought to say throughout the world because that never crossed my mind to ever do that. But when I began to pray for the world, something began to change inside of me and then we got an invitation to go outside and i remember and we went twice we went to went to belgium to preach and to denmark and then i went a couple times with a, a youth uh, ministry out of kentucky to latin america and every time i'm thinking one off you know that just one off experience but we were in the philippines preaching and uh we've been taken to the bible college and Traffic is horrific in Manila. No traffic in the world like Manila traffic. So you always leave plenty of time to get there. This day the traffic was not as bad, so we're a little early. So we're sitting in the vice president's office just waiting, you know, for the classes to end, for everybody to go to chapel where I'm supposed to speak. And, I'm, and they hand me a school yearbook. As I'm sitting there just, you know, kind of, you know, doing what they want me to do, entertaining myself. I'm looking through the yearbook. And I come across a photo of some students from Myanmar. And so I said, just, I just, with, you know, I didn't look up. I just said, I see you as students from Myanmar. I have been praying for Myanmar for years. I would love to meet these students. And they said, we'll make that happen. So I spoke in chapel and afterwards they pulled all the students from Myanmar together and we had a little bit of fellowship with them, which was cool. And, uh, and then that evening, when I get back to the room, my wife hands me a cut stone. I don't know if I got that stone again, if it's in this. I have a, I have a backpack with me as well, and the room we're staying in. Some stuff is in it, and some stuff is in here, and that's in the backpack. A little cut stone. When we got to our room that night, my wife hands me this cut stone, and I said, what's that about? 
She said, didn't you see the way the vice president looked at you when you said you've been praying for me and Mar for years? I said, no, I was looking at the yearbook. She said, when you said that, her jaw fell open and she just stared at you. She said, after the chapel, she said, while you're meeting with the students, she came to me, she said, Linda, I have to go teach a class. But would you give your husband this stone and tell him this story? She said, one of our students, a young pastor from Mandalay. Now I need to stop there a moment. As I prayed for Myanmar for years, my focus was a young pastor from Mandalay. I would pray, just feel led of God to pray for a young pastor from Mandalay, whom someday I believed I would meet. She said, we have a young pastor here from Mandalay. And he brought me this stone and he said to me, would you buy this stone? His story was this. He had come to the school on a grant, but the grant had fallen through. He had no money, no resources. He said to this faculty member, would you buy, vice president, would you buy the stone so I could pay my school bill? She said, I'm a missionary. I don't have the resources to you know, put all the students through school. But she said, I felt the Holy Spirit said, I want you to buy the stone. So she said, I bought the stone and said, Lord, what am I going to do with this stone? And the Lord said, I'm sending somebody to the Bible college who has been, quote, praying for Myanmar for years. I want you to give him the stone. And when I said that, and uh, I was five years before I could tell the story at all without crying. I heard. Because you see, when I prayed for Myanmar, I didn't pray with great emotion. I didn't sense any strong anointing. I had just written stuff down, had it on a three by five card. You know, on Mondays I would pray for uh, a particular region, the, the Shan tribe, and on Tuesdays it'd be a different tribal group. And I would pray particularly for the women in Myanmar because they have a high role in society. And I would, and I just had particular things I prayed for every single day unemotionally. But you handed me that stone, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I was listening. All those years you've been praying, I've been listening. There is no question in my mind the young pastor from Mandalay was the young student in that Bible college. In side note, I said to the, to, the, to the vice president, well, the next day when I saw her, I said, how much does he owe on his school bill? She said, $100. I said, no, no, no. What is his school bill You know, for the year? She said, $100. She said, but for him, it may as well be a million. And I said to her, his school bill's paid. It's not only paid this year, it's paid next year. Before my wife and I leave the country, we'll stop by the offices of your denomination, we'll write out the check, his school bill is covered. He doesn't need to know where it came from, but his school bill is taken care of. I am aware that a lot of the doors that God began to open for travel came out of this season of praying for the world. When God began to put a burden, and this little boy from the farmland of Eastern Illinois had no desire, finds himself now, he and his wife, standing on the ground watching an airplane going overhead, and these crazy thoughts, we should be inside of that. <laughs> and if we're in any place too long, my wife will start getting this itchy feet. We can be in the middle of an incredible move of God in Terre Haute, and she'll begin to say, but I want to know what's going on in the Philippines. You know, what's happening in Italy. And various places that we have been in that desire to begin to because God puts something. Now, God may never take you around the world. That may not be your assignment. But as you go around the world in prayer, you're opening the doors for others. Now, your intercession may not be around the world. The focus that God may give you may be your city. Indeed, I would submit that there has to be that group of people that say, this is my city, that God's called me to live here, that I will become an intercessor for this city. You may be an intercessor whose focus is government. You may be an intercessor whose focus is church life. My wife is what I call an assignment intercessor. That is... She, it, it, to pray through a list, drive her nuts. If you give my wife a list and say, here's what I want you to pray for, she can do it. 
but she doesn't like doing that. And after a while, she's like, oh, you know. But what she likes to do is just begin to worship. And as she's just worshiping the Lord and loving on Jesus, he begins to give her a burden, something he wants her to pray for. And she begins to focus on that. That's her assignment. And so she may spend her entire prayer time focused on that one thing. Now, I'm one of these guys, you can, you know, here's my list for Monday and for Tuesday and for Wednesday. God will use you according to who you are. Number six. I can spend more time, but I won't. So number six, petition. Petition. Three-word definition, share my needs. Share my needs. It's Matthew chapter 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. And then it goes on to say, For he that, you know, him that asks receives. Him that seeks finds. Him that knocks, the door is open to that individual. He said, you don't have in James because you didn't ask. Now, for a lot of people, petitions, the, whole, the only thing they do in prayer. You know, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's their entire prayer. And God wants us to be more well-rounded in that. But prayer is the way that God wants you to get your needs met. And so it's appropriate to bring your needs, the needs of your family, the deepest concerns of your heart and your life to bring them before the Lord. Much teaching on prayer focuses right here in the area of petition and how to pray with faith and, and the proclamations and all that sort of stuff that becomes a part of the whole teaching on prayer tends to be on how do we make our petitions and our intercessions to be more effective. And that's valid. That's a good thing to do. And, uh, but petition somewhere in prayer that I take the time to say, God, this is what I'm concerned about. Here's what's going on. Lord, uh, I've got more month left than I've got money. <laughs> you know, and I, I, need, I need your help on this thing, Lord. You know, we've got this coming up and I need you. Lord, my son is sick. And Lord, you said in your word. Okay. Uh, number seven. Let me move on. Number seven. Uh, key word. The word. Again, word. Only this time, three word definition, pray the word. Pray the word. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 29, it's not like my word like a hammer. Breaks things down. It's like a fire. And so Jeremiah 23, 29. And then Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Let me give you at least two different ways, three different ways <laughs> You can pray the Word of God, okay? Uh, I'll give you three ways you can pray the Word of God. You can pray the Word of God by bringing specific promises from God's Word into a situation. So here you may actually combine praying the Word and petition. So you're bringing your petition before God, but you're bringing a specific promise from God's Word that relates to your petition. For example, you're praying for healing. Lord, I'm coming before you. And Father, you said in your word that healing is the children's bread. I am one of your children, Lord. And I have a need of healing. So I'm coming to you today for a slice of bread. And I am believing that I'm receiving healing, the children's bread, as I'm asking. You see, you just bring God's word right into it. You're bringing a promise. You can do that with a lot of the promises of God's word. Secondly, and I love to do this, pray the prayers of the Scripture. Ephesians 3, Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, Philippians 1. Paul prays some absolutely incredible prayers. In the days, I just like to go to one of those passages of Scripture and simply begin to pray that prayer that's in God's Word. Only I will substitute. So let's say I'm praying in intercession. And let's say that as I'm interceding, I'm praying in particular for the pastors of the city of Dunedin. Let's say that that's my prayer focus. And so maybe what I'll do is I'll go to the book of Colossians and begin to pray out of the book of Colossians. Because he's, he's talking about Epaphras. And, so, and then he goes on to say this. Uh, this cause since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. 
to desire that you be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So maybe I'm praying for the pastors of Dunedin collectively. Father, I'm asking today that you would fill the pastors of Dunedin with the knowledge of your will, that you will give to them an understanding of what your will is in their lives and in their churches and in their city. Father, that you would cause them to walk with all wisdom. The Lord, that these pastors will walk with the wisdom of God in their life and that you would give them an understanding of the things of the Spirit. Lord, I ask that they will walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Lord, I'm asking that you will so uh, enable the pastors of Dunedin that as they live before you, that their lives will be found to be pleasing to you. And Lord, that they will be fruitful in every good work. So Lord, I'm asking that you'd increase the fruit of the ministry of the pastors in Dunedin. And Lord, that they would increase in the knowledge of God. The Lord, their personal relationship with you will increase. They'll come to know you more and more. And then, Lord, I pray according to verse 11, right out of the prayer, Lord, that you would strengthen the pastors of Dunedin with all might, according, Lord, to your glorious power. Lord, that you would give the pastors of Dunedin patience and long suffering with great joy. And Lord, I give thanks to you for the pastors of Dunedin because you made them to be me to be a partaker of your inheritance. That's a very positive thing to pray over the pastors of Dunedin. And all I've done is taken a prayer that Paul prayed and simply inserted. And sometimes I'll, I'll insert my own name and I'll pray for me or for somebody that's an individual. So pray the prayers. Well, here's another way that I like to pray scripture. I love to just pray through either a passage of, of Scripture I may be reading. You know, as a preacher, I love to pray my way through the books of First and Second Timothy because it was written by Paul to a young preacher. Now, I know I don't qualify as much as I used to as a young preacher. Um, you know, it's increasingly depressing for me to go to meetings and realize I'm the oldest person in the room. And to sit the group of preachers and realize I'm the oldest preacher in the room. But I love praying through first and second Timothy, just reading the Word of God and praying the Word of God. And so I will do that in a portion of my prayer time, just read the Word and then pray. Now Linda put together in a real prayer manager she has passages of Scripture that relate to certain areas. For example, praying for the church, praying for family, praying for souls, uh, praying for the school system, praying for the government. And she just pulled together passages of scripture that relate to that subject area and then as she's praying God's word over those areas she can begin interceding for a particular area and go to that and say Lord here's what you said in your word now I've been running around with this little thing called God's promises for living which is similar to that it is uh, passages of scripture that relate oh here's a section called how to have God's divine protection so it's verses of scripture that all relate to protection. And so I may pray God's word, but just take this and I just to read this section and pray through this. These, by the way, that I have in my left hand, were in Vietnam. And a young pastor came to me and he said, these are the list of all of the house churches that are under my responsibility. Would you pray? He was like 26 years of age and had several hundred people that he was responsible for spiritually. He said, would you pray? I can't read it, it's Vietnamese. But I carry it with me. And every now and then just say, Lord, you see these in this list. And then somebody this week, last week in Gore, was out to uh, the field days, and John Key was there, and they asked him for his autograph, and they gave him one of the Encounter Jesus things to sign. So he signed his name on the back of it, and then he said, I want to give that to Michael. And so one of the evenings we prayed for John Key and then he gave this to me and this will, I will carry this with me basically from now on. And as I'm praying for the Prime Minister of New Zealand, as I have already been doing for years, I'll just say, Lord, you know, I pray for John Key and I'll lift him before the Lord. So there's many ways you can bring the word into prayer. Number eight, because I'm about out of time and I want to cut these guys for quickly. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Three word definition, give specific thanks. Philippians chapter four, verse six, in everything, 
with thanksgiving. Now, you can do this a couple of ways. You can take and block off a portion of prayer time where you give thanks to God for something. Or you could sprinkle it like salt throughout your prayer time. So, you know, you're praying for, uh, okay, let's say you're praying for the prime minister. And you just say, Lord, I thank you, you know, Father, for this man's ability in the business world. And I thank you, Lord, that he's brought some of that business information. You, know, you can just sprinkle a, a, a word of thanksgiving. One of the most challenging stories I'm giving thanks was uh, Dick Eastman told about being in a circle where the guy in charge said, we're going to go around this circle, and every one of us is going to give God thanks for something we've never thanked him for before. So he said, I'm sitting there thinking, okay. He said, I know. I'll give thanks to God for the electric light bulb. Nobody's going to thank God for the light bulb. He's a person number seven. Lord, I thank you for the light bulb because because of the light of the light bulb, I can read your word. You know, now what am I going to do that? The chair. I'll thank God for the chair. He's a person number 12. Lord, I thank you for the chair that I am sitting in. Otherwise, I'd be sitting on the ground. I thank you for the chair. He's like number 18. You're thinking, God, he's the time to get to 17. He said, there's nothing left to thank God for. He said, then it came to me. He said, Lord, I thank you for this moment. Because I've never had this moment before. And every day I'll say, Lord, I want to give thanks to you. And I want it to be meaningful. So some days it's, Lord, thanks for the good night's rest last night. Sometimes it's, Lord, thanks for that awesome service last night. Thanks for the anointing of your spirit as I was sharing your word. Thank you, Lord, for that sister that got healed last night. For the, for the young guy last night, Lord, that gave his heart to you. That I found out after the service, somebody said, man, God gave you that sermon for him. And it just was, thank you, Lord, for what you did in that situation. Or maybe, Lord, I want to thank you for my parents. I want to thank you, Lord, that I was raised in this situation. Or, Lord, I want to thank you for my wife. Of all the people in the world, Lord, that you chose her for me, I thank you for my wife. And so there are moments I do that sort of, and then other moments, Lord, I want to thank you for salvation. Thank you, Lord, you know, that for redemption. Thank you, Lord, for justification. Thank you, Lord, for sanctification. Thank you, Lord, for heaven that I'm going to get to go to. And so just but giving God specific thanks. Number nine, this is something we do in church on a regular basis. Singing, singing. Three-word definition, praise in song. Uh, Ephesians 5, 19, uh, Acts 16, 25 and 26, Paul and Silas were in jail singing. Zephaniah 317 would suggest that God sings over us. Do you realize that God's a singer? We think of the angels singing, but actually the Bible says that God sings. And we sing often in church. Do you ever sing in your private prayer time? I find that, now sometimes I will change the order and I'll start with singing. You know, come, uh, come before his presence with singing. So sometimes I'll, I'll start with singing. And sometimes I'll sing some great hymn of the church. Sometimes I'll sing some new song, you know, that we've just been singing. Sometimes I make up my own song. I was at a church one time doing my prayer time, and in the empty auditorium, I thought I was in there by myself. And I'm making up my own song to the Lord. And the door opens. And this repairman walks in with the strangest look on his face. <laughs> That's okay, I wasn't singing to him anyway. Probably one of the most powerful moments my wife and I have ever had collectively together in our life with the Lord happened one night about 2 o'clock in the morning. We were driving, one of those long drives evangelists can get on, and she's at the steering wheel and she's driving, and I'm sitting in the passenger side of the vehicle towing our articulator, and we're singing to the Lord. We're making up our own song. Our song probably would never get sung around the world but the Lord seemed to enjoy it. And while we were singing to him, the presence of the Lord came into that truck and I heard him say to me, what can I do for you? And it was like this blank check moment. Whatever it was we asked him for, he was going to do. And I think I understand Solomon better now. 
when the Lord said, what do you want, Solomon? And I said, Lord, that's too big. I don't even know where to start with that. You know, it's like I don't want to ask the wrong thing. I said, but I think what I want is just more of your presence. And if I can live with unbroken chains of encounters with the presence of God. And God's honored that. To where people have suddenly said to my wife, lady said to my wife one night, are all of your meetings like this? She said, like what? See, your husband said the Lord was going to come. The presence of the Lord would come. He did not hype it. He just said it was going to happen. And he did. Are all of your meetings like this? And we went, uh, yeah, pretty much. He just keeps coming. And I am eternally and will be eternally grateful to him for that. But part of that came out of that night. We are just singing to the Lord our own song. Number 10, meditation. Meditation. Three-word definition, ponder spiritual themes. Ponder spiritual themes. Uh, two passages of Scripture. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, which is the only passage that I'm aware of in the King James Version that promises success and it links it to the meditation on God's Word. As I meditate on the, on the Word of God, there's a linkage to success. And then, and then Psalm 77, verses 11 and 12, gives us three things you can meditate on. The Word of God, the works of God, and the wonders of God. You can meditate on God's Word. And I love to read the Word of God, and then meditate on that same word I just read, ponder it, think about it, let it go over my mind. Sometimes just a phrase. I have various patterns that I read by, and I went through a season where I may only get three or four verses read in an entire hour. Because I would read a phrase, I'd just sit there and think about it, meditate on it. Just let it go over and over my mind, let the Spirit of God draw truths out of it. And then pray it. So I read it, meditated, and prayed that Word of God. You can meditate on the works of God. You can meditate upon the works that God has done in your life. So coming out of Thanksgiving or connected to Thanksgiving, you can meditate on how God saved you. You can meditate on how God has healed you. You can meditate on the types of things that you have been a part of, that you've watched God do. I love just to, in fact, I tell people, if you want to bring the presence of the Lord, sit around with a group of friends and tell Jesus stories. And start telling stories of what Jesus has done. When I sit around with friends and tell Jesus stories or stories of revival, it is not long until you begin to sense the presence of God comes into that place. He loves to be a part of those conversations. You can meditate so on, on the creative works of God. I've often said that I think the Lord's allowed Linda and I to be, become a part of the New Zealand scene because He loves to hear us say, wow. We just drive around the nation looking at the works of God in creation and just say, wow. Lord, you did awesome on that part. Lord, I think you worked overtime on this nation. And just drive to some parts and just go. There are some stretches I never get tired of driving through in New Zealand because the incredible beauty of what my father made. Mm -hmm. So to meditate on that or meditating on the one, just meditate on who he is. He's beauty. Meditate on that. Meditate, he's holy. He's awesome. So you can meditate. Number 11. The 11th thing that you can do is listening. Listening. Now here's the difference. We had waiting, which is total quiet time. Listening, three word definition, let God speak. If you're in a conversation with somebody and you do all the talking, that's rude. If I'm in a person conversation with God, then somewhere I need to let God talk. <laughs> so you may want to again, just spread that out throughout your prayer time. You've been asking God for wisdom on something? Just go quiet and listen. God may speak by dropping a verse of Scripture into your heart. And you go to that verse of Scripture. Oh, there's the answer. 
what you're asking God for. God may speak with that still small voice inside of your heart, listening. Let me give you some passages of Scripture. John 10, 27. My sheep know my voice. He has a voice. And we're his sheep. And he wants to speak to us. 1 Kings 19, 12. Proverbs 20, 27. Psalm. Here's, here's a little pattern I went by. Psalm 16, 7. Followed by Psalm 20, verse 2. Followed by Psalm 20, verse 4. I don't think that's quite right. Look back there. Psalm, Psalm chapter 16, verse 7. It says this. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. So he said, I'm going to bless the Lord because God speaks to me. And in the night season. And he said, my, my reins or his reins uh, my reins instruct me, my mind, one translation says my kidneys, the innermost part of my being. But in Psalm 17, uh, verse 2, and that's when I wrote down wrong, Psalm 17 and 2 says this, Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Other translations worded a bit different, but I like the way the King James put that. Let my sentence, my future, my fate, come from you so Lord in this situation I really need to know what is your judgment what do you think I should do about this Lord Lord I have two invitations which is the one I should accept which is the place I should go Lord I've got two job opportunities Lord would you let me know which is the one that you want me to take because you see things I don't see so Lord, I want my will to come into neutral so Lord let my sentence come forth from your presence and then I like Psalm 20, verse 4. Grant thee according to thine own heart, fulfill all thy counsel. You see, when my will comes into neutral, I say, Lord, I want you to instruct me. And then often what God begins to do is put into my heart what is his desire. So sometimes then getting God's direction may come over a course of several days. In that time, I'm letting God speak to me. But as I get my own, because I recognize that often I go into a situation with a bias. Here's what I want. And so I have to come to the point of getting my bias to neutral. So it's no longer what I want, but what does he want? And so once my bias is in neutral, now God can begin to put into my spirit what he wants. And then I can begin to know that his purposes begin to become the things that rise inside of me. And then number 12, last one, praise. Give God glory. And it's Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, <laughs> where the Lord ends the Lord's prayer by saying, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I believe we exit the same door we came in. We made a complete circle. I began by telling God who he is. And I exit by doing the same. Hallelujah. Well, I'm in overtime, so I better shut up. I love to pray. What I'm going to invite you to do and challenge you to do over the next few days, take those verses of Scripture, read through them, meditate on them. And I believe some of you will find that it will be helpful for you in your own personal prayer life, your own personal journey with the Lord. And if God does inside of you even a portion of what happened to me as I begin to practice that, because you see, it brought the stability that I needed in my life. It gave me a sense of balance, a wholeness, that part of my prayer time is worship. Part of my prayer time is bringing to God my needs. A part of my prayer time is finding out what's on His heart and partnering with Him. Because you see, the way God so structured this thing, He gave the earth to Adam. That's what God did. And Adam, in turn, gave it the authority of it to Satan. And so while we know that ultimately God will take the kingdoms of this world and make them the kingdoms of His Christ, He hasn't done that yet. So at this point in time, even though He's still God and could do what He wants, He will not violate the way that He set things up. 
And since he gave it to Adam, he respected what Adam did. So he's waiting for you and I to invite him to step into a situation because he's given us as the descendants of Adam, we still have that authority that God invested. So God's waiting for us to say, Lord, I want to invite you to come and step into this situation. You know, one of the strangest prayers I ever prayed over somebody in a service, I'm standing in front of this person, and I just had this crazy impulse to pray this. Oh God, would you come and do God stuff? And I'd say, what? And so I just I said, Lord, would you just come and would you do God stuff? And the next few moments, God came and did God stuff. I want, I believe that this well-rounded thing, it develops us personally into who God wants us to become. In fact, what I've just shared with you, and I've shared this with my wife many times, if I could only speak on one message the rest of my life, what you just heard is what I would share. Now, I am by calling of God primarily an evangelist whose thrust is I get the privilege of sharing the good news, giving invitations, and I love to do that. But if I am speaking, especially in a situation with believers, as much as I love talking about revival and all the principles of revival, personal revival begins with my relationship with the Lord.